Hello, and welcome to the MOAS webinar this evening. My name is Nicole East, and I'm the Executive Director of MOAS. Um, we are excited to have Dr. Lerby, who is the Medicare Contractor Medical Director from Neridian with us tonight to talk about the changes that are directly going to impact you in your office. So without further delay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Lerby. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for coming in the early evening. We're going to talk about slides. We're going to, we have slides. We're going to talk about certain things, which you'll see in a moment. Let me change the slide. There we go. Got it. And now we change. We're going to discuss the following. We're going to talk about current medical review what we're looking at in the last six months or so what had been stopped during the COVID uh, epidemic was medical review and we hadn't looked at a lot of charts so TPE has restarted called targeted problem education I'll tell you what it is I'll tell you what codes we're looking at that might affect oncologists we're telling you how to deal with the review for records how to appeal and make sure you get what you're entitled to get. Then we'll talk to some future ENM documentation rules, some of which are still changing because the, um, and we'll talk about it a little later, but the, they have now decided to end the final uh, emergency uh, on May 11th. We'll talk about decision making and time. We're not going to go into details about coding because we did it in the noon session for your office, but we want to talk about what you get paid for, which is either decision making or time and a whole bunch of clues on how to write it down and document it so you get the most value for what you write down. We'll talk about shared specific your very sick patients who may be in the eye, certainly true for certain oncology patients when your white cells are washed out or when they have all kinds of problems um, that you may be sharing it with a, a nurse practitioner a PA or another member uh, of your office. We'll talk about more about rules and regulations, some of which are still in the process of changing um, because of the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and because of the act toward the end of 2022, uh, uh, which don't take effect until until April or June or toward the end of 2023, including about telehealth. And uh, that's what we'll concentrate on. We'll also ask any questions. Now, targeted and probe, uh, and ed, targeted program education is what we do most of our reviews on. The principle is you get a letter first, a letter that looks like you're, look, you're seeing on your computer tells you that there are going to be three rounds of prepayment. You're going to look at particular codes, um, and then they're going to either deny it before they pay you um, or not deny it. And if it's very high denial rate, then there's a second or a third level. To give you a better understanding, here's a picture of the general process. Topics are selected. They're selected based on the amount of codes that come up. What do we have in California that is higher than significantly the average of, of codes across the country? And if it's an outlier code for whatever reason, and there are lots of good reasons that are not clinically wrong, um, we'll look at the top number of those codes. Now, for example, there are clinics and university centers that take certain types of cancers that other centers don't do. There are certain procedures and lab tests that universities do or certain labs do that others don't. So it wouldn't be surprising if you do a lot of something to be asked for records of those they want. They will ask for 20 to 40 claims, but they won't be in a row. It'll be maybe the first, the fifth, the ninth, the twelfth, till they reach 20 or more. Uh, that's so they don't hold up your money too long because in between you'll be paid for the claim. So we look at 20 to 40 claims and if they're all good, if the claim denial rate is 3% or 10% or 15%, they say, thank you, you're compliant. We go away for that series of claims for at least a year. If there's a high rate of denials, then we're told the denial rate, you'll get a letter and I'll give you an example of it. And you can at any point then 
talk to the nurse who did the review and say, well, what's wrong? And be educated or at least discuss the things that weren't there. Now, most of the time that's because the documentation didn't have certain elements. You know, we have NCDs and LCDs and we may talk about them, but if we have a local coverage decision, you're supposed to have everything about that decision in your note. So we'll tell you what's missing. We wait 45 days, if again, there's a high denial rate. And after 45 days, we do another 20 to 40 claims. If you markedly improve, like from 70% denial to 20%, thank you, goodbye. If not, you can talk to, again, a nurse reviewer. And at any point, if you want, you can talk to one of the medical directors as a backup, and we'll try to explain what, what the problem was or what we didn't see. There are, a min, a, there are you can go up to three rounds, uh, and after three rounds, there's still a high denial rate. And by the way, if you don't send in a record because you didn't get the message, that's considered a denial. Um, then we go to CMS and say, what do you want us to do? Most of the time they say do a fourth because you've talked to us each time, but it's possible they could look at 100% of your records for a year or eight months or something like that. Or even if they think it's on purpose, you're denying things, they can send you to the OIG, but, but that's rare. Mostly they'll just ask for another set. And I can't think of very many times when you didn't correct everything because we told you what you need to do and you do it, particularly oncologists. They are not, they're very hardworking people. By the way, I admire you because I see that every week or two, there's another biologic or oncologic drug that you're supposed to understand. Is it better or worse or different than anything else? And then within a week or two, suddenly are advertising in, on television in every type of show except kitty shows trying to tell you that you should tell your doctor what you want, which is not a good idea. Uh, anyway, what comes next? Well, you saw the letter. You'll be required for maybe every third or fourth patient date of that code. It's outlier of outliers. And uh, it also can happen if last year you billed maybe uh, 55 claims of that code, and this year you're billing 255 there's a marked increase. Now that can certainly be for a good reason. You added someone to your group and that person's a sub, sub, sub specialist in lymphoma or in a type of leukemia or you know a certain type of pancreatic cancer. So the fact that you're asked for a record does not mean you're doing anything wrong. We're just saying, tell us why you did it and what you did. And therefore the documentation becomes particularly important. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So, pick us up, up from the floor when you get a request, find out what charts we're looking for. Please, please don't ignore, because sending them is not a big chore. After you send in, after we receive between 20 and 40 charts, we'll, re we'll review them. A nurse will review them. If they have a question, they'll bring it up to one of the medical directors. We have eight or nine medical directors. We have plenty of them around. My principal area tends to be um, California, Nevada, and Hawaii. So I may see a bunch of them. And I'm very pro-physician, as most of you know. I'm an AMA delegate and a CMA delegate and um, a member on the board of the American College of Physicians for California and Endocrinology Group for California, et cetera. So we're very, I'm very understanding of the needs of physicians. And we talk to you regularly at various meetings. You get a report of the result and it'll look like this. In this case, you had 20 claims for prepayment review and 19 were accepted. So you have a you know a zero error, um, maybe you have a 3% mistake and something you didn't put in. Thank you, goodbye, we're not gonna bother you again. So this is a letter you'll get and it's over. So, or We'll tell you what's wrong. You can talk to the nurse who reviewed it. You can argue if you want. There's nothing wrong with talking. So what sort of codes do I think maybe oncologists would get? These are codes that we're currently reviewing that I think might be ordered by or related to oncology. 0394T, which is electronic brachytherapy, although you know radiologists tend to do more of that. Possibly colonoscopy if you're looking at uh, uh, at a uh, colon cancer. 
Um, if you happen to do anything in an earth, a sniff, or a corf, uh, various types of anything that you might order, CT, head, brain, or any other part of the body, particularly head and brain right now, uh, chest x-rays, um, again, because of uh, potential metastases, um, CT for planning effects, uh, perhaps uh, digital brain tomosynthesis, or diagnostic mammography or DEXA scans, particularly if you're looking at the skeleton and concerned about metastases there. Um, uh, proton delivery, uh, again, although the radiologists do much of that, but you could be involved. Uh, Everybody is doing drug tests these days because of the um, rate of people who were unfortunately addicted. Um, you may do be ordering unlisted molecular pathology or a whole bunch of MALDEX codes, molecular diagnostic codes, because a lot of them may have predictive or treatment value when you're dealing with early or middle stages of cancer, whether there might be spread or the like, including circulating tumor tests. Now, some of those recently that people are rushing to that are not officially covered by Medicare or anyone else are fairly faulty. So hopefully you can distinguish between those that are faulty and those uh, that you can rely on. Um, some other topics you might be looking, obviously, because some of you do infusions in your office, you may be looking at IV infusions, uh, uh, IV injections, chemo infusions, and there's a difference, of course. Um, robotic linear accelerator and a whole bunch of drugs that you may or may not be using for certain types of cancer um, that are listed here. These are ones we're actually looking at from time to time. So I'm giving a little bit of a warning. Um, robotic nuclear accelerator-based stereotactical radio surgery, um, drug tests, because like I said before, um, and I think those are the key ones that I think we might be looking at that would affect you. Now that you you might be involved, depending on your involvement with some primary care in some patients, that there'll be other codes. We are not officially looking at e &M codes right now, but it's important to understand them because the payment has changed. And I'm sure you've heard lectures on that already, so we won't go into detail. But no mistakes, you need not fear. A request for extra charts will disappear. We'll reimburse your claims if the documentation is clear and won't bother you for at least a year. Now, what are we looking for in the documentation? And this is where I'm speaking more to the physicians involved than I am to, um, to the office people. We talk more about the NM and the coding. When you order laboratory tests, particularly from an outside laboratory, we may ask the laboratory for why was the test done? And they may ask you for something in your chart. What we would expect in a hospital is that there's an order in inpatient or outpatient hospital uh, for the test written by you or one of your colleagues. But if it's in the office and you called it into a either radiology or, or a laboratory, you have a reason in your chart that says what it is. Like this possible. I mean, let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, let's say a general internist of the patient with hypertension, but it looks a little strange and it's a little episodic. Well, they might order a test to rule out a pheochromocytoma. So if they're writing something that says rule out pheo or rule out unusual hypertension, you know, or concerned about if there's anything in there that says they're looking for it, even if the test is negative, we'll give you credit because there was a reason for it. So a brief note that shows a reason for perhaps an unusual test, and particularly if it's a test that has just an expensive test, uh, like molecular diagnostic, what you're looking for and what you might or not expect to find. The same for imaging tests, but in order that the radiologist gets paid, we may, you may need to show or give them an instance where uh, you're thinking about something you think needs to be done. When you are paid for your e &M codes, it was changed in 2021 for your office visits, and you do plenty of office visits because you're managing patients with serious uh, uh, 
on college disease, or now for your institutional patients, for people in an observation or in inpatient hospital or skilled nursing or unskilled nursing, or even for home, the way you're gonna be reimbursed, the level of reimbursement is based on either the time it took that day or the decision-making that you had. And no longer, although it's expected you will do an appropriate history and exam for that visit, no longer will that history and exam count for the level or value of your test. So your documentation is to be based on trying to show what you are looking for, what plans you have. Decision-making includes three things in general. Um, and what you're thinking at the time is important because if you think something will be, will impact the patient, uh, that will be something you should write down. Uh, so let me go back for it. Decision-making, there are three things. The number of problems you're solving at that individual visit, the number of active problems, the amount of data that you are reviewing either before you see the patient, while you're with the patient or after the patient, again, on that 24 hour day, midnight to midnight. And data includes, of course, laboratory tests that haven't already been studied or noted, uh, and also getting data from a caregiver that takes time or a translator that takes time, um, a family member, all of these that you need to spend extra time with count toward it. And the third is decision-making has to do with the risk to the patient for what you're going to be doing. Ordering drugs, which is part of the data, but the drug also has a risk, particularly in older Medicare patients with underlying comorbidities. So when you're giving an oncologic drug, there may be a moderate to a high risk in deciding, should you do it? Is it safe to do it? What you have to look for? what other drugs you're on, and that makes decision-making much higher, which means you'll be given a higher, you should bill for a higher code of e &M. And that's true now, not only in the office, but also in the outpatient hospital, inpatient hospital, and they have the same codes now, uh, skilled nursing facility, unskilled nursing facility, even home, and all the things that are home. Now let's move on to national coverage decisions because they're somewhat important. There are two types of already existing language for coverage. Now, Medicare covers all services that are reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis and treatment of an illness or injury or to repair a damaged organ, fine and good. There are some things it doesn't cover under federal law because it's an insurance program, not a health program. So it doesn't cover cosmetic surgery or cosmetic services. It doesn't cover experimental services unless the experiment is part of a federal experiment group, in which case it will cover experimental in that situation. Now, a national coverage decision is made by CMS. There are meetings, typically at the meeting, your associations, MOAS or the national uh, associations, ASCO um, or ASH will be there um, and ask for opinions. And they will have a MedCAC meeting, which is a opinion meeting. And then they will look at all the opinions in the literature. Then they will have an open meeting where any of you can discuss what you want on the national coverage. And then it is published on a certain regimen. Once it's published, it will either say what is covered what cannot be covered. And they usually give you the codes, codes that they tell you what codes are covered and what are never covered. In between, something that is used in between that is neither covered nor uncovered, uh, then it goes to a MAC, uh, a, a local contractor, such as Neredi and my company, and we look at it. They can't be changed. A medical director can change, like myself, cannot change at NCD nor can any other group like a qualified independent contractor or a minister of law judge. What is a national coverage is national coverage. They do change from time to time and they change the codes from time to time for two reasons. One is science changes. 
And the other is that every year new codes come out from the AMA and um, both CPT and ICD codes. And so they may be added or subtracted because the codes have changed for whatever reason the code changes. A local coverage decision is made by a local contractor or by a group of contractors working collaboratively. That is being done more collaboratively in order to make coverage more, to make it similar uh, or almost exactly the same across country, across different states. Um, in that situation, there is a meeting called a CAC, a Contractor Advisory Committee, in which subject matter experts, professors or very well-known practicing people are invited to look at literature and make your opinion of what literature is appropriate, what is established and what should be done. Then there is a later meeting after we, the medical directors of the collaborative group or individually see the literature, then we put together a draft policy and there's an open meeting in which anybody can come and talk and typically uh, companies that make drugs and companies that make diagnostics or, or um, other type of services are there promoting what they think is right for the service. Uh, often they promote the cost they think is appropriate. At any time, you can send in literature, you can attend the meetings, we publish them. Um, and even if you have, if, if a LCD or local coverage doesn't have what you want for your patients, you can always do one of two things. One, you can ask that we change a local coverage. You can request that by simply asking us to change, add or subtract something and give us the literature that shows it's the right thing to do. Or you can ask for an individual consideration for a specific patient. What would be an individual, individual consideration? Use of a drug off-label, if there's literature to support it. By off-label, I mean using a higher dose or a lesser dose or a more frequent dose. As long as you can support it for an individual patient, it'll always go to a medical director and we will approve or disapprove it based on literature you send or literature we look up ourselves. So you can always ask for an individual consideration. And if there's a denial, now in all local coverage decisions and in national coverage, we usually have the codes printed for you so you can see which codes pass. You can ask for more or less if you think there aren't enough codes, um, but we tell you what code to use to make it even more simple and what language to show that the code is appropriate for that patient. LCDs and NCDs are posted in Noridian's website and in CMS's website, and it's not hard to find. Now, I said earlier that documentation is key. And in fact, in the 1964 law that was Medicare, in the second paragraph, it said Medicare will pay for all services that are reasonable and necessary, the diagnosis and treatment of an illness or injury or to repair a damaged organ. But what is reasonable and necessary? And the truth is that the only person who knows what's reasonable and necessary for that patient is you, the doctor, or the nurse practitioner, or the other office person, uh, PA, uh, in your office, um, who's looking and examining the patient. We don't know what the patient has or doesn't have, but the only way we can pay for it, we can review it, is by reading what you wrote down. So what you write needn't be long. It just has to explain what it is so that we could see it through your eyes and then be sure to reimburse you the right amount based on AMA RUC and sometimes from um, in category two codes, what the CMS thinks, uh, what the CMS thinks is appropriate. What about fighting back? How to respond to requests for records or charts? It doesn't matter if it's to us or to anyone else. You know, when you start your office or if you have your office, you have a certain type of practices. This is what you do. You have policies. So if a new patient comes, you take their name, their address, their history, the people uh, who care for them if they need caregivers. Uh, you take their insurance information and other things like that. Well, also you should do have a policy for what to do if a rector is requested. Have a set process, which is clearly understandable 
by the people who deal with it. One person or a couple of people, depending on the size of the office, should be the same ones who deal with requests for records, whether they're from Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance company, because the same thing would apply. I would have a checkoff sheet that says, is the document you're sending in legible? Uh, typically, it will be if it's uh, from an uh, electronic record, uh, but if there is any legibility, you can write next to it or type next to it or send it another piece of paper, and if it looks about right, we'll accept it. Is a signature legible? Well, if you sign charts like I do with a scrawl, maybe you ought to do what I do when I have charts, which is to have a sign-off sheet, which says, here's how I sign my name with my typical scrawl, and if that scrawl looks like the scrawl on the chart, fine, we'll accept it. Make sure it's the right patient, because a lot of patients have similar names, and a lot of us work in groups of doctors, so it's the doctor we're asking for, the date that we're asking for it. Because remember, we only ask for one claim at a time every, every fourth or fifth, so make sure it's the right claim, the right doctor, the right patient, uh, make sure there is a signature. Make sure it's sent to the right address because we're not the only people who look. There are other Medicare auditors and other private auditors. So make sure you send it to the place that it's supposed to go because otherwise it goes in the, in the uh, circular file. Um, send it timely. Know how to get records from the hospital because so many of your patients are treated in the hospitals, particularly the sick ones who are going through changes and metastases and certain types of treatment in hospitals. Um, and finally, I would recommend sending it by, by certified or equivalent mail because yes, we lose things, not a lot, but we get hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail every day and claims. And yes, we're human, and we make mistakes. This way, you know it was sent, you know it was sent on time and you can show that to us. Now, there is an appeal process, and I'll just mention, you can look at it later. Of course, the initial determination is to uh, Noridian, and all you need is a dollar at stake. Um, if you don't like the, the, uh, the denial or you think we did it wrong, you can ask for a redetermination. There's no penalty for doing it. Uh, you have 120 days, that's four months to file. Uh, for the initial determination, you could do it up to one year after the service was done, or the date of service. It's a redetermination three months, of, I'm sorry, four months after you got the denial. If you don't like that, you can go to a separate company called a Qualified Independent Contractor. Uh, you have uh, six months to file from the time it was denied, and you still only have to have a dollar at risk. If you don't like that, you have two months to, to uh, send it to administrative law judge and you need about $180 to file. If you don't like that, you can go to the Department of Appeals Board. Not that many people do. That's usually to say that we didn't do the law right, didn't appeal right. For the most part, uh, the uh, Mr. Law Judges side with you. And then if, it, if it's a really huge claim, mostly a hospital claim, they may go to a federal court. You don't need an attorney to do that. You can just go represent yourself, tell them why you did what you did. Um, we may have a paper that says why we think it should have been paid. Uh, we may even, someone may even go there, one of our nurses, to explain why they felt it didn't meet our criteria, and the judge makes a decision. You can amend records. This is a long slide. You can look at it later for time. Let me see how time is coming. Yeah, I better hurry. Um, a late entry, if you've missed something, or an addendum, if you've missed something, you can add it. When you add it to your chart, Put it as close as you can to the original part. Sign it, date it when you put the addendum or additional area in. An addendum may occur when you change your diagnosis because a lab test came back that you didn't have, you know, maybe a path report or something. Uh, it should be as timely as rational. Uh, if you're supposed to have reporting within two days, that you know may take time. If you need something to be typed, it may take time. Just add it in handwriting or type or change your computer to do it and never write over or delete what isn't there. Let us see the original and add what you need to add. And most of the time we'll accept it as long as there's a reason for it and it makes sense. Now to remind you, 
about classification of services. In the office, you have new patients or established patients, and that hasn't changed. A patient is someone who you haven't seen or the same specialist in your group hasn't seen for three years. An established patient is someone you have seen or your associate of the same specialty has seen within three years. If you have a multi-specialty office and you're an oncologist, but you have a nephrologist, that's a different specialist. That would be a new patient with a nephrologist. And a PA or NP would be the same specialty as you do in your office. For visits to hospitals, nursing homes, or other areas, it isn't new or established as much as the initial visit and subsequent visit. The initial service is the first time you see them in the observation area or hospital. Subsequent service is the second or more times you or the same specialist from your office sees them. And we'll talk a little bit about split shared services later. So understanding, and there is not such thing as initial or subsequent in the emergency room, each visit is an initial visit in the emergency room. And you don't count for e &M separate reported services, which would be like a procedure you did. Everything involved in the procedure is separate. The time of the procedure is separate. You're paid for the procedure separately. It isn't part of the e &M service that you're documenting. I said it before, but the levels of an e &M service are based on decision-making, which is the amount, uh, the number of uh, problems the patient has that visit, uh, the amount of data that you're doing, orders you're writing, et cetera. And then that's the second part. And the third is the risk to the patient, which would include interactions of drugs, making a decision for surgery, making decisions for a complicated procedure, such as maybe um, having orthopedists do um, an epidural block or that kind of stuff. Uh, time. And um, I said this already, the three elements, the number of complexity of problems, the amount of data reviewed, and the risk of complications. You can have these slides. There are three categories in data. Test documents, orders, or independent historians. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and um, if it's already been reported, then the, the man, the to re report looking at data doesn't count. But if you're looking for a different reason, it might. Let's say you're an orthopedic surgeon and you get a disc back from a radiologist of an MRI of the spine. Well, it's already been read, so you don't get credit for reading it again or the time in reading it. But if you are looking at it to make a decision of whether surgery is required or whether you're going to operate anterior, laterally, or posterior, whether maybe you want to use radiation instead, you're looking in for a different reason that would count toward decision making, if you can explain it that well. Um, here's an example of a moderate uh, number of things you can look at. You can look at this later. The risk of complications, the highest element of risk prevails. Some of the highest elements of risk would include deciding to have major surgery, having to go to the hospital for chemo, um, prescription drugs that um, may get involved, other drugs. I mean, certainly giving an aspirin wouldn't be a major problem, or Tylenol, unless the patient had major renal disease or on an anticoagulant, and you're concerned that there might be bleeding from the aspirin or the dose was unusually high. Uh, things like that, or you're giving aspirin to a rheumatology patient, that's in methotrexate, et cetera. And the high risk, like I said, might be surgical decisions or hospitalization or serious comorbidities. Um, and social determinants of health may play a role here because you have a patient who needs insulin, but the patient has no place to stay, so they can't take insulin or store it anywhere. Then you have a, you know, more decision-making. How can I get around it? Can I use another drug? Can I give a weekly injection of SGLT2 drugs or something for type 2? Things like that increase the risk, and therefore you get more credit when you are billing. Again, you need to have a brief history and exam, but it doesn't count to the level of service. When time is selected, all the things you do on a day of visit before you see the patient, while you're with the patient, 
after the patient, including independently interpreting results, like looking at a whole bunch of glucoses that were done at home to see if you need to change their, their insulin pattern or their um, oral medicines, um, talking or referring to a specialist while the patient is around to know if they should or shouldn't see the patient, care coordination, all these things in this slide count from the midnight to midnight. So again, when you're doing these things, you take credit for it, add the time together. Now, you don't have to have a list of every single time element. You can have a single note thing. I spent 45 minutes, 60 minutes doing A, B, C, D, E. That's adequate. You can sum it up and explain what it is. It doesn't have to be 18 pages long. And my recommendation is in the beginning, look at decision-making and time both for a couple of patients or have your abilities do it. And then you'll know which to use more often, which gives you the most credit, which in all honesty gives you the best remuneration. Prolonged service, there are codes, but the prolonged service codes for Medicare are face-to-face -face and they're not the same as for private uh, outside of Medicare services. Um, the next couple are for non-Medicare using 99358 or other prolonged, and you can look at them at your will. For Medicare, the prolonged service for an office or outpatient is G2212. For a hospital or observation, remember they're treated the same way, it's G0316. For a nursing facility, it's G0317. For a residence or home, if you're doing a house visit, and residence now includes guest homes, includes um, places where patient and board and care homes, uh, included actual homes or hotel rooms, GO318. Uh, and if you're doing prolonged visits for, for preventive services, it's G0513 or 0514. Uh, we don't cover consults. That's just a regular vi initial or subsequent visit. We don't cover prolonged service without direct patient contact, which is covered on the private side in some insurances, but reminding you that. And um, the next slide shows the prolonged service amounts of time for office CNM. And, and it's a little confusing. You have to have you take you have to have had the maximum time of the maximum service. So for your office, it's 99205 or 215. And here's the amount of time. Once you reach the highest level, 74, you have to add 15 minutes before you can do G2212. Kind of strange because if you're doing it for prolonged in the hospital, again, it's the highest code. You have to add 15 minutes and then each additional 15 minutes and in the hospital for any code you use with time, the time must have been met or exceeded. That's all been explained in detail to your office builders at noon a couple, about a week or two ago. And those slides are available. And um, certainly um, you can ask for them. Uh, in fact, they're available as much as these are. They're somewhat similar. Use prolonged time in a chart nursing facility or home. And this shows the extra time you need, uh, which is, CMS says they may put the two together or make it more sensible, like waiting an extra 50 minutes or not in the future, but I haven't done it yet. And there's a bunch of things that I haven't done it yet. So that's that. What's somewhat important is social determinants of health, because as I said before, Uncle Sam and private companies and everyone is trying to figure out how we can make more equitable care for people who, who are in trouble and need it. Now there are, currently there are um, six or seven Z codes that talk about social determinant problems. And I will show you a couple of slides from CMS itself that talks about the fact that they're interested in these Z codes. They're collecting data on them. If you put them in, um, they're deciding hopefully that you document them. Uh, they put a sentence or so in that in fact, this patient couldn't understand because of literacy or because of language. 
this patient uh, was homeless, didn't have adequate housing, didn't have adequate nutrition, didn't have adequate social skills or help. Um, they're gonna map some of these to the Z codes uh, and they're gonna use them in the future uh, to help understand how to make things better. Here's the list again that you can look, healthcare administrative codes, the healthcare team codes, the same codes and the actual codes that were listed are here, there are 10 codes. And if we go one more slide, here's a full list of Z codes that CPT, the ICD-10 codes will have as of April 1st, 2023. And learning to understand them and use them will be beneficial. We're all looking how we can use them together to help the patient and also to help the physician um, who uses them. Okay, we've done this before. Payment for physicians are based on mostly the AMA relative uptake value scale, uh, which puts together for every single service, every single um, CPT service, a work and overhead and liability. Work is the work you actually, the training you had, the work you actually have to do in time and, and practice overhead is actually a collected data of all the things that you use. The AMA collects it from various specialties. They know what it costs to do the service you're doing. Uh, of course, there is no cost or minimal cost if you're doing that same service in a hospital. So it's a separate hospital fee and liability. And these three are multiplied by uh, it's called a gypsy, a geographic factor constant, which compares your work, work with other professionals here in California, uh, compares the practice expense to um, other practice expenses, um, overhead and liability to other states and other areas. And then after these adjusters, there is a, um, the payment rate is then multiplied by a federal money amount, which gives you the amount of money that you make. Um, the current conversion factor, it's called a conversion factor, is $33.8872, 8872 thousandths of a dollar, um, which was lower, but was raised because of the good work done by ASH and ASCO uh, and AMA and the state associations, et cetera. Uh, they raised it. We hope it'll be raised again. I don't know what they're going to be doing. Um, and then in the future, maybe in 2024, they'll look at the medical economic index. They won't for, didn't for 2023. Um, and um, they're trying to look at global surgery. For a while, they were thinking of making surgery not global, but only the day of surgery and then each visit being separate. But pressure and discussion from the various surgical specialties uh, they didn't do it. And so they're trying to figure out how it's going to be valued. One of the problems is sometimes, for example, um, in cardiac surgery, the cardiac surgeon does the surgery, but the cardiologist does follows most of the days in the hospital, part of the 90 days, so that the surgeon actually doesn't do all the days that are listed in the alleged 90 day post op. The uh, cardiac cardiologist does, and he's paid separately. So Anyway, CMS is looking at that, and what they do, I have, I have no real idea. Split shared for 2023, when you see a patient along with uh, another person of the same specialty, including your nurse practitioner or, or PA, um, the substantive portion of the visit in the hospital uh, or in the out observation or nursing home uh, is the person who does a substantial portion, 51%. Uh, it's not just time, it could be sub if the substantial portion is a history or exam, uh, whatever the substantial portion, both persons who saw the patient write down what they did, but the billing is done to the one who did the substantial or 51% of the work, or if you're using time, they use time in 2024, we don't know that yet. Telehealth will continue. Um, you may have heard that there may be some changes of some of the telehealth after May 11th when the PHE ends. Uh, but my understanding is that most of telehealth will continue. This could change. 
till the end of 2023. Remember, however, that first of all, telehealth includes the use of uh, therapists, physical, occupational, speech, language, and audiologists. They can do telehealth. Mental health people can do telehealth, but I believe every six months they're supposed to see the patient in person once. Um, the place of service is where the patient is now. Um, and um, you use uh, the, the code um, uh, 95 for uh, the, the show that the place of service was in 93 for audio only, which may not continue too much after, after the uh, uh, end of the uh, physician emergency. But I should warn you or tell you that states have their own rules on telehealth. And so that if the PHE ends, look at your state law about whether you need to be licensed in that state to do telehealth. It doesn't make sense when a cardiologist in California is seeing a patient and that patient goes on a vacation or an oncologist in California and they goes on a vacation for a couple of days to Las Vegas and they, something comes up, they can't see their California physician but you got to check the state law to see if the states have agreements and things like that, because um, the federal rules will you know, un, uh, unfold. Other pr proposed changes, you can look here. None of them are going to affect you particularly strong. We're getting toward the end of the hour. Um, for a few of you, you may be doing a cognitive assessment and care plan. If, in fact, you notice the patient is having cognitive, cognitive impairment, and you would notice because you're always concerned about those cancers that metastasize to the brain or spinal cord that would affect cog cognition. Um, there is a code 9943, it pays close to $300. Uh, and if you look at the uh, bottom of the page, you can click on it and see if you wanna do it or have the primary care do it. Here's a whole list of screening services if you wish to look at them. If you click on the Medicare Preventive Services part of it, it'll take you to the same picture, you can click on the picture, it'll tell you how long, what you have to do to do it. Um, and uh, it's time to ask all the questions you want. I did it in a little under an hour. Um, ask your questions if you have them, if not, I'll have one final slide. And maybe Nicole, if you wanna monitor um, the chat box or, or whatever, and thank sure. you for the opportunity, by the way. Thank you for the opportunity to work with uh, oncologists. Uh, some of my friends and others, my, many of my patients, uh, have had miracles from recent oncology situations. And I really um, admire their hard work. Um, I see a, a picture of uh, Dr. Wallach, who I've often sat next to at the Ash Asco meetings and welcome, of course. Uh, anyone have any questions? So I have a question. So when we do the EMA, e EM code, so we should be documenting the time that we have spent? You can document either the decision making or the document. A recommendation in the beginning, because some of you are very rapid uh, and some of you are slower for a number of reasons, depending on your patients and translation, blah, blah, blah. If you're using time, then you have to put down what you did. You can put each element of time in, but it's probably better to just put in the total time of that patient that day, which had all the things in it, and uh, say what you did for that time. And it doesn't have to be long. I did A, B, C, D, E. If you think decisions are better or harder, or you have a lot of difficult decisions to make, and you were able to make it fast because you're used to this, then use decision-making. Use whatever works best for remuneration uh, because it's based on either the total time or the decision making. Sabina, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Feel free to unmute your line or go ahead and type it into the chat. And if you think of it later, because if you always think of it later, and I think I have to send the second part, because I broke them into two parts, I have to send a second part. Or you could send the, the first slide list, either one, they're very close, uh, Nicole. Um, sure. If you think of a question later, send it to uh, Ms. East and I will, um, I will get them. Uh, the reason if you send it to the association is helpful because some, a lot of the questions will be similar. 
is sometimes one answer will cover like four or five questions to make it a little easier on us. But we will get you answers no matter what, whenever you have a question you're not sure of. All right, uh, last chance to ask a question. I don't see any in the chat coming through. And let me do the last slide. Um, maybe you appreciate it, but oldies and goodies like me, and of course, Dr. Wallach is a goodie, not an oldie, but um, we'll appreciate that it's changing. Used to be, it was a doctor, family doctor, an internist. That was a specialist, an oncologist, maybe a surgeon, uh, but there weren't 10 specialists. There weren't a whole group of people. Now, healthcare is becoming a major team sport filled with subspecialists of size and sort. Charts are written, but not very clear. Docs will talk, but they rarely hear. Thus, quality of care is sorely falling, falling short. When I look at chart records, I often see the same order by different doctors because they're not reading it or talking to each other. And so I thought I would give you for about one minute an example of perhaps the best example of people who talk at each other but don't listen. chart, some of the charts, I feel like I'm listening to Abbott and Costello. All of you who are listening, thank you for your time and effort. If you have a question later, I or one of my colleagues will be happy to answer it. Thank you very I much. I would like to, hopefully, if I would like to maybe in three or four months when the PHE is over in the end of May or June and new rules come out. Maybe I could help you then. Other than that, I want to thank you for your attendance and whatever uh, Nicole wants to um, say uh, about, I mean, about, about anything, go ahead. Sure, uh, I was actually, I was going to end, but I think Dr. Wallach had a question. I was just going to say, thank you, Dr. Lurvie, again and again. Um, this was really very helpful and we'll have to digest it and have you, uh, follow up, as you say, in May or June. Thank you. My pleasure. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lurvley, and thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all for your help. Bye. Bye-bye.